Everybody out in the front entrance, come on in. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Emmanuel Church. For those who don't know me, my name's Kyle. I'm the lead pastor here at the church. It is great to get to worship with you today. Uh, today is also a special day because it is a family Sunday. So all the kids are welcome and invited in for this week as well. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit noisier, a little more chaotic, and a whole lot more fun. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, heads up for everyone sitting over here, our projector just died on this side. And so, I'm sorry, you got to look across. And if you can't see that far, you might need to shift on over to this side or squeeze up to the front to help you out. Um, as we go through worship uh, today, I just invite you to worship in whatever way is most beneficial to you. If that means standing and singing and that's where your head and heart is, uh, you're invited to do that. If you need to just sit and reflect and maybe let the week go back to Jesus, uh, you are welcome to do that as well. However you feel comfortable to worship, you are invited to worship that way today. So as we uh, prepare to start with singing as the first part of our worship, why don't we stand together and I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to gather. God, we thank you for a sunny, beautiful day outside that makes it easy to come to church. Lord, uh, we thank you for the fact that you are present here. Holy Spirit, we just invite you uh, to, to move in our hearts and minds in ways that only you can today. And Lord, as we gather with all the generations of our church today, I pray that it would just be a lot of fun this morning, that there would just be... Uh, great encouragement from kids to older adults and older adults down to kids. And Lord, um, would you use that to just continue to build your church family. And so Lord, as we give this time over to you, uh, we just pray that you'd be glorified. And we pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. my wrestling and in my doubts in my failures won't walk out your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea whoa you are the peace in my troubled sea in the silence won't let go in my questions your truth will hold your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa. you are the peace in my troubled sea my lighthouse my lighthouse Shining in the darkness, I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore. the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you, whoa. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore. Fire 
are before us. You're the brightest. You will lead us through the storms. Fire before us. You're the brightest. You will lead us through the storms. Fire before us. You're the brightest. You will lead us through the storms. Fire before us. You're the brightest. You will lead us through the storms. My lighthouse. My lighthouse shining in the darkness i will follow you my lighthouse my lighthouse i will trust the promise you will carry me my lighthouse my lighthouse shining in the darkness i will follow you oh my lighthouse my lighthouse I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. Safe to shore. Safe to shore. Safe to shore. You can grab a seat. Well, that was fun. Thanks, Front Row, for leading us in the clapping and actions. We need some practice. We'll have to do the song again for everybody else to get it, but that was great. Uh, as we continue on in worship, just want to uh, remind you there's opportunity to worship God through our giving. Uh, you can do that all sorts of different ways, digitally, as well as at the Connect desk. Uh, for those who are new and visiting, no obligation to give. But for those of us who call this place church home, uh, it's our way of giving back to what God's done. Right? I see giving oftentimes as, as an exchange of gifts. And while it's definitely lopsided, because God gives us everything, it's an opportunity for us to just respond to him in appreciation of who he is and what he gives us by giving back to him. And so it is an act of worship. And so uh, for those who are regular, you probably already know how to do it. But again, on the slide, you can visit connect Hannah at the Connect desk. And we'd love to just help you worship God through your giving. And that giving goes to running all sorts of ministries that we have here at the church. It's part of us supporting uh, local ministries and global ministries where we are partnered with individuals who are trying to bring the good news of Jesus to different people uh, across Canada and around the world. And so it's a great way that you can support uh, those different ministries. If you don't know who we support, I also encourage you to head down the hallway uh, on the left-hand side past the bathroom. Sometimes no one ever gets past the bathrooms, but if you head down that way past the bathrooms on the left, there's a board that just plugs all of our local and global partners as well as is, there's a bunch of different opportunities of things going on at the church that are plugged up along the wall. You'll also see it before and after service on the slides, but we have some different Bible studies coming up, a new course called the Bible Course, which is going to kick off after Easter, where it helps us over eight weeks figure out uh, how all the Bible works together and what each book of the Bible sort of has to say, what its context is, and so it gives us a greater picture of understanding God's word to us, and so I would encourage you to sign up for that or for precepts or one of the many other things that's going on at the church. Another really important note uh, for everybody who calls this place home, but especially for our members, next Sunday uh, we're going to have a meeting where we're the elders are going to be presenting, uh, once again, a new iteration of the leadership structure proposal to our church family. So there's going to be more details about that coming in the newsletter on Thursday for time and everything, but it's going to be here in this room. We'd love to have it because there is changes from the last proposal that we gave out to you. Uh, we heard some of the feedback, made some modifications, and we'd love for you to come and join with us. So mark that on your calendar, and we look forward to having you at that meeting. And then finally today, I also just want to uh, get your attention, if you weren't already caught, to what is happening out front. But we have guests today uh, from Camp Quanos. Uh, Camp Quanos is actually a 
partner organization of ours in that we are one of the founding churches of that camp and we actually send uh, delegates every year to go to the AGM. So Nina's our representative right now to be on the board and to uh, participate. And so what we're going to do is we're going to watch a video uh, that is based around their th summer theme song. So every year uh, there's students who are there and workers who are there who write a theme song for the camp for the summer. And so this is the video that plugs that and then Scott's going to come up and share with us a little bit about camp. So let's watch this video. This way to jock slide and so long. I usually take a jet stream, that'd be so much fun. Oh, yeah, guys, there's my bed. I'm going right here. I'm going right So, guys, what has been your favorite part of the week so far? I love the night game. I love yeah, that. That was so fun. My yeah. favorite part, I have to say, is when. Half of our cabin went on the rocket. We lost like half of yeah. our guys. Only, no, only. <laughs> the first day I was kind of skeptical of who I was getting in my cabin. Oh, yeah. Please don't put that in. <laughs> I really like the concert. That oh, was yeah. The songs that they make at Q-Town, some of them are just like, yeah, like rock and roll. <laughs> like, how did they come up with the song? No. Like, how did they just really reach your heart? Definitely the awful part. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, over it. Oh, I'm like the dead one. I've always loved the one. Screamer and Jack Scream just took it up. The screamer with Jim. It was awesome. I saw some weather that felt so good. The kind of place we knew you would. We loved and lived the kind of life. We've all been trying to find the feeling that we got deep inside. So My favorite part of the week was meeting all you guys that were in my cabin and just, you guys are such great people. This is my home for one week of the summer. This has like been the best week of my summer and probably the year so far. Yeah. I'm just so happy that I'm here. I feel like we're a little, like a little family. I didn't miss you guys so much so after much. this so week is over. Like I feel like we all connected yeah. like so well and it was so easy to talk to you guys about anything. I drove 11 hours to get here. What, is it worth it? It was definitely worth it. I think that I'll say that this will end up being my favorite part of the week. Oh,
Does that get you excited for summer? I mean, winter is almost over. That means that summer is coming. Now, we live in a world where it's getting harder and harder to know what's real. I mean, AI can now make fake things look very real. Social media filters can make a person look uh, very uh, different. Sometimes people see this video or they, they see our brochure that's out there and they say things like, where is this place? Is it really like that? And can I go there? Well, yes and yes. But when a person comes, they find that activities and adventure are only part of it. Uh, they discover there's something very different at Camp Quantos that goes far beyond uh, the fun. Uh, they feel welcomed. They find acceptance and belonging and a deep sense of love that's at the heart of it all. Whoever they are, wherever they're from, whatever they believe, they're all treated with the same love, care, and respect. They come to camp and they encounter the truth and love of Jesus, and it changes them. Now, in this video that you just saw, in that scene at the beginning where those boys had that sleep out, uh, out at the beach, uh, later that night, one of those boys asked uh, his counselor if he could talk to him at the end of the dock. Uh, the counselor was my son, Jared, and he told me that the water was like glass. He said the stars filled the night sky. He said it was so beautiful. Can you picture the scene? Now, this boy had been hearing a lot about God all week, and it was all new to him because he and his family, they knew nothing about God. Uh, they're from a family that never goes to church. He was asking many questions all week. He'd been experiencing God's love uh, through the week. That night, under the stars, at the end of the dock, he decided to give his life to Jesus. He decided that Jesus was real. And even though he knew he didn't understand it all, he decided to put his faith in him. And Jared told me it was the best night of his entire summer. This summer, uh, we are going to help children and youth find what real life is all about. What is real life? Well, that's life with Jesus. Uh, that's the life that Jesus came for us to have. We call it life like no other at Camp Quantos. Sadly, though, so many kids today, they don't know that life. Instead, the life they know is one filled with all the brokenness, confusion, and lostness that comes from living a life separate from God. We're going to share with him that Jesus knows the way to go. He tells us what's true. And he's the only one that can open the door to real life. Life the way he intended it to be. And at the heart of it all is an amazing love. A love that only comes from Jesus and is available for everyone. Now, the world hears this and they go, that is just too good to be true. Uh, like this camper last summer who asked his counselor, is this all true? Does God really love me? I want to believe that there are some big implications if I do. Or like this news reporter last year who asked me this, how can parents know you'll treat their child the same when they believe something different? Well, my answer is always the same. This is what we do. This is what you and me is what we're all about. And it's because of our faith in Jesus. Some campers are so overwhelmed by experiencing this love that sometimes they find it hard to even describe and put it into words. I'll never forget this one girl who got up in front of the entire camp at a last night fireside of sharing time. And through tears, she tried to tell us how welcomed uh, she was made to feel. Uh, she had never experienced love like that uh, before. This is actually one of the reasons why I'm here today with you, is to invite you to be a part of this amazing mission to share about this love with everyone, especially kids. A camp, it's such an ideal place for God's love to break through into a person's life. How does it happen? Well, kids come out of the city. They leave Abbotsford and they come into the midst of God's beautiful creation. Uh, they experience incredible adventure and fun. And they're accepted for who they are by people who really care uh, they discover truths from God's word in a language that they can understand. And best of all, they don't just hear about God's love. They experience it firsthand for themselves. And you put all those things together, and it, just, it, it makes sense that we see so many kids uh, make decisions to follow him uh, day after day, week after week in the summertime. And we do this together with you. Emmanuel Church, you guys, you're one of the owners of Camp Quantos. We do this together. This summer, we're seeking to welcome over 4,000 children and youth from all through greater Vancouver, up and down of Vancouver Island. And the only way it is possible is together. 
There are many ways that you can be involved to make a difference. Let me share a few uh, with you. So first of all, maybe you want to help a family that isn't able to afford to send their child to camp, and you could give to our campership fund. I also want to tell you that we have a program called Side-by-Side -side Camperships where the camp works alongside the church, and that could be with you as well, where we together help so that everybody that wants to come uh, can come to camp. Uh, maybe you want to come over and help us get ready for the summer, as some, some families in here already do. At the end of May, people come together, and all those things you saw, we've got to set it up. We've got to get ready uh, for the summer. That's family work we can do into the May. Maybe you want to come and serve for a week or two. Or maybe the entire summer. There's opportunities for all ages at camp. Our oldest is in the 80s. Our youngest is in the teens. And we represent every decade in between. Uh, or maybe a leadership training program. A big part of Camp Kwan is it starts at grade 9 if somebody's turning 15. Three different levels in the summer. And it's such an amazing opportunity to put your faith into action. Meet some amazing people as well. There's an open house on June 8th. So some of you are thinking, I do want to see what that place is about. Here's a way you could do it. Come over on June 8th. We'll pick you up at the ferry terminal in Nanaimo. We'll bring you to camp, give you a lunch and dinner, drive you back to the ferry terminal. It's all free. Uh, you can just see the camp, your camp. You can see it for yourself. We'd love to have you come over to the open house. Or you can come as a camper. You can come as a camper. There's still opportunities to come at our camps in the summer. Uh, there's family retreats in May and June. Uh, there's a young adults retreat. I can't... Uh, wait to see what God is going to do in the lives of thousands of children and youth uh, this summer. I invite you to be a part. Thanks so much for letting me share with you today. I'd love to talk to you after. Thank you. Great. Thanks. That was great. We look forward to hearing more stories about how, how kids' lives are changed at, at Quanos. I invite you to stand with us as we Sing a few more songs. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God that's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. And yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. And yes, I will bless your name. And yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy for all my days yes I will I count on one thing the same God who never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same god who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out and yes i will lift you high in the lowest valley and yes i will bless your name and yes i will sing for joy when my heart is heavy for all my days yes i will and i choose to praise to glorify glorify the name of all names nothing can stand against and i choose to praise to glorify glorify the name of all names Nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. 
Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. And yes, I will bless your name. And yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy for all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory is your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Feeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory is your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. Never once did we ever walk alone never once did you leave us on our own you are faithful god you are faithful every step we are breathing in your grace evermore we'll be breathing out your praise you are faithful, God, you are faithful. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. And I walk through the fire with my head lifted high and my spirit revived in your story. And I'll look to the cross as my failure is lost in the light of your glorious grace. Yes, I walk through the fire with my head lifted high and my spirit revived in your story. And I'll look to the cross as my failure is lost in the light of your glorious grace. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. You are faithful, God, you are faithful.
Were creation suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified. Were the whole world echoing his imminence, his name would burst from sea and sky. From rivers to the mountain tops, We'd hear Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. When every creature finds its inmost melody, and every human heart its native cry, then in one in raptured hymn to praise, We'll sing Christ, be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. I won't bow to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just a doorway into resurrection life. If I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing. Yes, my song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified. From the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. You can have a seat.
right, so today we're continuing on our series. It's actually the, the last message in our series on the seven letters to the seven churches found in Revelation 2 and 3. If you've got a Bible, you can flip with me to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 14 to 22 today. Um, but in this passage, there is an illustration, a word picture that Jesus uses to speak to the church he's writing with. And so I want to invite a couple people up to help me bring this illustration to life. Can I have two volunteers who are willing to help me? All right, there's only two of you. So let's go. Come on up, girls. Thanks, Kazmir. Thanks, Maya. So uh, in our passage today, there is uh, three types of water that we can think of. Why don't you two split up, one on each side of the table? I know, I'm sorry. But then everyone can see. Uh, and in it, there's hot water, cold water, and lukewarm water. And so we're going to do an experiment to see which is the best water. You're already guessing? You're already taking a guess? Do either of you drink tea or coffee? Okay. Kazmir drinks tea and coffee. Maya, not so much. Okay, so that's yours. That's yours. You got to take a huge gulp, Maya. Uh, no, you don't. Okay, so the hot water. Let's test it. What do you think? It burnt my tongue. It burnt your tongue? <laughs> it just tastes gross. It tastes <laughs> gross. Okay. Okay, now imagine it wasn't a drink. Imagine it was a hot tub or a shower. Hot water okay? Uh, sure. Sure? Do you like getting in the hot tub at ARC? Well, it depends what uh, I was doing before. Okay, it might depend if you were before, but maybe you were cold, maybe even swimming, your muscles are sore, you hop in. What do you think? Like drinking hot tub water? No, not to drink. Good question, good question. Oh. No, like just getting in. Do you like hot water? You like getting in a hot, hot tub, yeah. not a lukewarm hot tub? Yes. Okay, now we're going to try some lukewarm water. You're already guessing? Yeah, Kazmir says it's gross. It is gross. Good, let's remind ourselves how gross it is. <laughs> Cheers. That was good. I'm going to spit that back out because I have to talk for the rest of my... Ugh, that was gross. What do you think? It doesn't taste good. It doesn't taste good? It tastes gross. It tastes gross. Okay, so now we'll get to the good stuff because I've punished you all along the way. Okay, so we got some nice ice cold water here. Oh, the good stuff. The good stuff. Cheers. Tastes good. Tastes good? You agree? Very good. Okay. If we had to eliminate one of these three waters, which one are we picking? Which one? Lukewarm. Lukewarm? Hot water. I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, okay. I'm going to vote with Casmira. So, sorry, Maya, your vote doesn't count. We're a democracy. So, we're going to go with the lukewarm water. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I want us to keep that visual. Yeah. They're the only two brave enough to get up and drink disgusting water. Um, but as we, I want us to keep that visual because that is the visual that we have in our scripture today. There's this picture of two types of good water and one type of water not so much. Unlike Maya's vote, though, it was a little bit different. We have this picture of the cold and the hot being really good, and we have a picture of lukewarm being what we all know, most of us not even having to taste it, we know that it just kind of makes us what? We want to spit it out of our mouths, right? And so in our passage today, we come to a letter that Jesus wrote to the church in a city called Laodicea. Laodicea is in uh, Turkey, modern-day Turkey. We got a map up here in a sec. It's the starred city. And that was where Jesus was speaking to a group of Christians who had sort of become 
meh lukewarm about their faith in Jesus. And so we're going to do our scripture reading today. I'm going to pull it out of our mailbox to remind us that this really was a Bible passage that was intended to be a letter received by the church. And we're going to read it together. You can follow along in your Bibles on the screen as I read our passage today. Revelation chapter 3 verses 14 to 22. Jesus says this. He says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write this. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire so you can become rich. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And a salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the doors, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. So whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to these churches. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we consider... These scriptures that you have given us, God, I just pray that our hearts and our minds would be open to what you would have to say. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you give us wisdom and insight into into your scripture. And Lord, we thank you that when you, you've told us that when we ask, your spirit delivers. And there's nothing that we have to do to earn our way into that. And so, Lord God, we just ask for wisdom today for our hearts and minds and for the whole of our lives so that we would not continue or be, or fall into being lukewarm, but instead we would be people who are passionate and all about your name. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So the city of Laodicea is a rather wealthy city during the time we read about here. And the reason it was a wealthy city was because of its location. It was actually perfectly placed to be on several different trade routes and it merged as sort of a crossroads where they held what we might think of as the stock exchange. It is the big booming banking center for the whole eastern part and into the western part of Asia and the Middle East and up eventually into Europe. Now, it might not seem like a a big deal to us today that there might be all these banks and there is sort of a stock exchange and market, but in this day, this was very rare. There weren't cities like Abbotsford that have banks scattered all across the city. You were very fortunate if you lived in a community that had a bank, let alone multiple ones, so that you could do trade. Because at the place where Laodicea was located, people would come up from Africa, they'd come over from the rest of Asia, they'd come down from the north in Europe and all from the rest of the Middle East. And as they did their trade, they of course came with currencies that maybe conflicted to the other place that they were trying to trade with. And so they had to have a bank located here was a big deal because it allowed wealth to pass from merchant to merchant and from community to community. And as all this happened, it also became this city that was really just interesting. A blend of people and cultures would merge on the city streets each and every single day. Now in a community like this that was vibrant and cultural and full of business and marketplace and and all this sort of happenings, you might think, well, a church in this kind of place would be vibrant. It'd be energized. It'd be an interesting place to come and worship God. But that's not what we see in our scripture today. Instead, we see that the people of Laodicea, in the church at least, were pretty meh 
about Jesus. They kind of come to this place where they'd just sort of lost their passion and excitement and they just sort of lived on and the drudgery of going off to the market to exchange. They got busy with all the things they had to do and in a culture like theirs where hospitality was really expected, so if you wanted to do business, you'd have to have people in your home, you know, all the time. There'd be all these different gatherings and feasts and and times to have your your business partners from afar come for a meal. They got kind of just worn out from cooking and cleaning and always having all this stuff go on in their city that they just kind of lost their passion. And we see that because in verse 15, Jesus says, well, I know your deeds. I know all the things that you're involved with. I know what you're doing, church, but I see that you're neither cold nor hot. And in fact, I, what I wish is that you'd be one or the other. Now, this is very different than the other churches that we've dealt with as we've looked at the seven letters to the churches in Revelation. We've had other churches where we've seen that there's false ideas and teachings. We've seen other churches that have allowed themselves to be infiltrated by people with ideas that go against the way of Jesus. But here, we have sort of this unique one in that it's it's not that they have false teaching. It's not that they're not loving their community or being involved in any sort of way but instead what they've done is they've come to this place where they just don't have any excitement about God the one that they're there to worship and to follow after and so because of this Jesus says in verse 16 I want to spit you out of my mouth and he actually points out the irony in what the people have to say he says you know what you guys go around saying I'm rich I've acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. But in actuality, you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. Well, what does Jesus mean? He means that while they think they've got everything, they're actually missing the thing that they need most. They're missing the thing that actually brings meaning and life to their hearts, minds, and souls. It's not just about external things. And so Jesus says, you're lukewarm. It's gross. This isn't what I want for you. Instead, I want you to be hot or cold. Now, that's a really important thing to pick up on. Jesus actually says that he would like the church to be either. Now, you might have heard wrongfully that sometimes people say, well, that what Jesus is saying is, I want you to either be passionate about me or totally against me. Right, Because typically when we think of somebody being excited about their faith, we think they're on fire. Right? We use language like that. They're, they're really hot about their faith. They're, they're burning up. They're excited. Right? We picture sort of flames. And then we say, well, to be cold is to be like an ice cube. And we use that illustration uh, back when we looked at the church of Ephesus where there was the frozen heart. And so we just automatically assume for something to be cold is, is bad. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. Instead, what he's doing is he's speaking to a church that's in a unique place. Laodicea is a city that does not have its own natural water source. And so it had to get water from other places. And so on one side, what we have is the city of Hierapolis. And in this city, there were these hot springs where people would go to bathe, and they would go to experience healing in the warm waters. Most of us are probably identifying with the fact that sometimes it's nice to have a hot bath or to go to the hot tub to let our muscles relax. So there's this sort of image that there's hot water that brings healing as it bubbles up from what is underneath. On the other side of the city, though, we have the city of Colossae, where we have Paul eventually writes the letter to the church of Colossians, which is the city of Colossae. And there, not unlike Hierapolis, where they have hot springs, they actually have cool, fresh spring water. The type of water that makes you just want to dip a cup into it as it springs out from the ground to have a drink. 
It's fresh. It's refreshing. It takes away all of the, of the thirst and being parched and being dry, which would have been huge for people who would be traveling all amongst all of these cities. And unlike us, not traveling in cars or buses, but for most of them, on foot through the Middle Eastern heat. And so in this city, the people knew that on the one side, they could go for the hot springs, and on the other side, they could go for the fresh water, but here they were stuck in the middle. And instead, what happened in Laodicea was that they had this overflow from the city of Hierapolis that came and and flowed through the valley and then came over a waterfall that was crusted in sodium bicarbonate, which basically just means it tastes bad. And what happened is as the water flowed that way, it became lukewarm. What was once hot at the source of the hot spring has now cooled as it's flown across the plain. And so if you were to be a traveler and to come into the city, you might see this beautiful waterfall and initially want to dip in and grab some drink. You would quickly find out that that was a huge mistake. That you were drinking the worst water that you have ever tasted. And so instead, what the people of Laodicea had to do was they had to create these aqueducts that would pipe in the water from these other places so that they could retain some of what they needed and desired. Otherwise, all they had was this lukewarm, nasty-tasting water. And so Jesus is saying that pool that you have at the base of that waterfall across from the city is what your faith is like. It's not being piped straight from the source like it should be. Now we might ask ourselves, and what, what might a lukewarm faith look like? Well, the best person that I have of giving an example of that is from a guy named William Booth. He's the founder of the Salvation Army Church. And he said at one point that he realized lukewarmness when he heard someone say what faith should look like. And what was interesting is he, as a a young man, was actually involved in a university lecture where an antagonist, so someone who was against the Christian faith, was coming to speak to this room full of people. And as William Booth sat there, he heard the lecturer have to say this. He said, if I believed what some of you say you believe, I would never rest day nor night to tell other people about it. And in that moment, William Booth realized as a person of faith, he wasn't willing to actually engage. He says, I believe in Jesus and I believe that I have a relationship with him, but you know what? It's not motivating me to do anything. It doesn't get me up in the morning and and drive me anywhere. It doesn't excite me to a place where I'm constantly seeking to grow. But instead, I'm I'm lukewarm. I'm just kind of living in this place and just taking what I have and accepting that is all I need. But really, I have this distaste about myself and my faith. If we Christians really believed and allowed what we believe to change us, what should our lives look like? Well, hopefully, if we're living with a passionate faith, our life is like the warm waters where it brings healing, where the words we have to say to others is, it brings restoration and life And it brings hope to people who are broken. On another hand, maybe it's like the cooling waters where it just gives somebody this this sense of, of newness and freshness. And the words we're saying actually help people's lives to be reoriented to the thing that will actually give them life to the full. But if we're not careful, we live in between those two places. 
And maybe we have a little bit of mixture of those two things in our own lives. But as they come to pour out for others, those who might be visiting our lives, we see that all we leave is a sense of just a bad taste. Now we might wonder, well, where do we get this sense of of health? Where do we get this sense of refreshment? Well, we see this in the words of Jesus right at the beginning. In verse 14, Jesus gives a description of himself. As he writes to this letter, he says this. He says, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. In each of Jesus' letters to the churches in Revelation, we see that he's been giving a description of himself that frames the understanding of everything else he has to say. So what could Jesus mean by saying, I am the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of creation? Well, if we start with that first word, the Amen, Jesus has a lot to say. Now, when we say Amen or Amen, typically all we mean is, I'm done praying. I'm done saying grace, so it's time to eat. Let's move on, right? Amen is this sort of stop to one sentence, start of another one. But in the world where Jesus comes from, in that time and place, amen had a whole lot more meaning in and above itself. To say amen meant something was utterly trustworthy. The words that you have spoken, you could build your life upon. It's a foundation. It's the concrete that's poured down before you build a house. It's solid. It's true. We can trust in this. It's properly set for the whole of my life. And so Jesus is saying, you need to listen to me because I'm the one who actually can be a good base. I'm the one who can actually bring, I can be that stone pipe that brings the goodness that flows into your lives. Again, he reiterates it and he says, I'm the faithful and true witness. I'm the real deal. What I say will happen will actually happen. Those things that I came to say when I lived with you on earth, I mean, and you can see the real result of following my teachings and my ways if you commit to them. Not enough for you? Well, I'm the one in control of creation. In another place in the book of Revelation, Jesus will say, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end, and he ties it into this sense of being in control of creation. He says, I'm the one who was there before anything here was created. Before you ever breathed a breath, I existed. Before the earth that you walk upon was created, I was there. And guess what? When it all falls apart, when one day everything needs to be fully remade, I'm going to be there. And in between all of this, I'm in control. Don't just think that I'm far off in some distant place. No, in fact, I am actively working in your life and the life of the person to either side of you and in every single place. And so when we think of what Jesus is saying here, in the context of this illustration of hot, cold, and lukewarm water, and then saying, I am the Amen, the true and faithful witness, the God who is in control of creation, what we can hear Jesus say is, I can't believe you're so meh about me and our relationship. I'm the one who's in control of everything. I designed the heavens and the earth. I knit you together in your mother's womb. I know you. I see you. I've lived for you. I've died on the cross for you. I've rose again so that by faith you can be saved. I've given you my Holy Spirit to give you wisdom and guidance and power in day-to-day life. I continue to give your life meaning and purpose And all you have to say is, eh, thanks Jesus, I guess, for saving me. Like, I guess this water will get me through the day. I don't like it. It's kind of gross, but I won't die drinking it. That's what my faith becomes. And Jesus says, because of that, 
It's a shame. Now, when he says, it, I want to spit you out, what he's not saying is, man, the sight of you makes me puke. No, he loves us. He's died for us. He sought that we would be saved and into relationship with him. He wants to spend eternity with us. That's by his choice, not ours. But what he's saying is, you've lost the good stuff. And I want you to have it back. I want you to have a real vitality that brings hope and healing and refreshment in your day to day. And I want that to be for the whole of your life and for everybody who might visit for a part along the way. That's why Jesus goes on from that place. In verse 17, when he sort of addresses the attitude, he says, you know, you say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, I don't need a thing. But what you don't realize is you're missing all this. You're missing out and I want you to have it. And so Jesus says in verse 18, so I counsel you, come to me to buy gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. Come to me to buy white clothes to wear so you can cover your shame. Come to me to buy salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. He continues, I, I, those I love, I rebuke. The reason I'm challenging you in this isn't because, I'm, because I hate you. It's not because I am displeased with you, but it's actually because I love you. I want you to have a different way. So what I want you to do is I want you to repent. I want you to turn to me. And it's not like you have to go looking because he says in verse 20, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the doors, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. You see, Jesus understood the reality that the Laodiceans lived in. He knew they were in this big, busy city and he knew that they lived in a, a culture of compromise. Just like what we saw in the other six letters, there's this challenge of the Roman worldview and the Jewish worldview to this new way of following Jesus and Unfortunately, the Laodiceans had sort of given up. They've compromised on some of their values by just becoming not passionate. Because if they're passionate, they face opposition. But if they just kind of keep it to themselves and go on their way, they can slide on by. And so what they thought is they thought, I have it all. I've got my life with Jesus, and if I keep it here in this little compartment, I have enough of that. And I've accrued my wealth. I work in the market and in the stock exchange and banks. And so I've got monetarily everything I need. And you know what? I, I've done it all. That's okay. I'm good. I have everything I could possibly need. But the tragedy is in that Jesus says you're actually missing out on the fullness of that thing that you say you have, which is me. St. Augustine put it one of the best ways I've ever heard. He said, the saying, I have everything, is a terrible saying if everything does not include the living God. We can have everything and think we have the world, but really we're missing out on that one thing. Or might I even say that we might think we have everything and we even have Jesus, but we've compartmentalized him in a certain way. So we think we have everything, but we haven't allowed the fullness of who he is and what he has to say and bring to our lives that really leaves us changed. And so this is why Jesus says, I want you to come to me and I want you to buy the gold refined in fire. I want you to buy the white clothes. I want you to buy the salves so that you can see. What he's using is different metaphors that made sense in Laodicea. Because it was a city that was known for its marketplace, it was also known in part for this huge fabric exchange. And so the money was exchanged in the banks, the fabric was exchanged in, on the fabric market, and there were places to go for healing where you could get salve for your eyes to help you. And, and what he's saying is, think about this way that you live, where you go to different sources for what you seek to get through in life. Well, what I want you to hear is this, you don't need to go to a whole bunch of different places. You don't need to try to acquire everything that you need for the whole of your lives. You just have to come to me. You just have to come to me because I want to give it to you. I want you to give you everything that you need. It will heal every problem. 
I'll address every need that you have as a consumer, so to speak, and I will heal every illness that you have. And the only thing that you need to do to receive that, as he says in, in verse 19, you need to be earnest and repent. Repent just means to stop what you're doing and go a different way. To be earnest means to show an intense conviction, to be passionate, to care with every fiber of your being. Jesus says if you stop what you're doing and trying to make sense of everything on your own, if you stop just living in, in this meh way that you're living in relationship to me, if you really orient your heart and your life in a passionate way towards me, I'm going to give you everything you need. It's going to go way beyond what you could possibly imagine. So turn to me. I'm waiting. And that's where he gives us what's maybe one of the most known pictures in all the Bible. He says, here I am. I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. I'll eat with that person and lay with me. He means in this world of hospitality, he means we are going to be united. We bring our families together. I'm calling out for you. I'm knocking. I want you to have all of me. But here's the thing. The door handles on the inside. Jesus isn't the God who comes in and he doesn't just kick down the door and say, give me everything. You're going to do it my way. No, instead, he's gentle and loving. And he says, I want you to surrender to me. I want you to receive what I'm standing out here with for your life. If you're here today and you feel mad about your faith, if you're feeling dry and stale, there's a good chance you are lukewarm. But it doesn't have to stay that way. Jesus says, you can welcome me back and you can welcome me deeper in. And as you do, you will receive the healing and refreshment that you need. And as we consider that, let me remind you of this one very important thing. If our lives are a house that Jesus is knocking on the door, we have to remember that a house has many rooms. Oftentimes, we can come to this, a sense of faith where we let Jesus into our life, and wow, what a world-changing thing that can be. I mean, there is just truth that there is full newness when we put our life and trust in Jesus. But the reality is many of us are just comfortable at letting him in the front door, and he can stand on the landing. But then what we do is when we have a guest, right? Anyone else this way that before someone comes to the door, you kind of close some of the doors along the way? If you got that bathroom that's tucked right next to the front door, you're like, mm, I'm just going to close that as I, I let my guest in. Right? We do that in parts of our lives, don't we? We let Jesus into certain places, but then we say, not over here. It's okay, come sit in my front room. Just ignore the kitchen. It's okay, you can sit here, but don't come to the laundry room. And what we do is we, we, we begin to compartmentalize different parts of our lives. We say it's okay for Jesus to have my Sundays. But I don't know if I want Jesus with me in my workplace. It's okay for Jesus to come to community group with me. But I want, don't want Jesus to say anything about my sexuality. It's okay, Jesus, for you to have an hour in the morning but I really want to decide how I use my decompressing relaxation time the rest of the week. I think we spend so much of our energy, so much of our passion in a misguided place. We spend it closing up doors from Jesus and then we sit and we wonder, why is there no vitality? Why is this Christian faith so lame? Why is it not getting me any place? 
But what I think Jesus wants to say to many of us here today is that not only does he stand and knock on the front door, but he comes to each room in the house of our lives and he stands and knocks. He says, will you invite me in? Will you invite me into this part? And as you allow him, as you allow him into that place, he brings healing and hope and peace and joy. He brings change. Say yes to Jesus in every single place and you'll find a newfound strength and passion and joy and hope for the whole of your lives. So how I want to conclude this today is I want you to just think for a moment of what room in your life, what compartment have you maybe kept Jesus out of? Then after a moment of giving you just a moment of reflection, what I'm going to do is just remind you of the things Jesus brings to our lives. I can't hit them all. because There's just so many things, but I'm going to hit a few. And then we're going to close in a time of prayer. And as you pray, what I invite you to do is to just open up to receive one of those things that you heard for that place that you know you need to open the door. So take a moment. What room of your life do you need to open for Jesus? If you haven't let, given your life to Jesus, Jesus brings a new and better way. Jesus brings forgiveness and an invitation into his family. In that room that you hide from Jesus because it's full of sin, full of things that aren't in the way of Jesus, Jesus brings forgiveness for what's been done wrong. Jesus brings peace as we learn to live his way and don't have to figure out how we do it on our own. Jesus will bring you love, not condemnation or shame. Instead, Jesus brings you a new identity of knowing you are loved and cared for and that he will wait. Jesus brings you his Holy Spirit he will not leave you, he will not forsake you or abandon you, but instead he will bring you his presence, his wisdom, his power, and direction. Jesus brings you a purpose for living in that place. He wants to give you himself to be passionate about and for. He wants to use every moment of your existence to bring change to the world around you. He brings wisdom in that place that you're confused. He brings fruit of the Spirit. He wants to bring victory over that sin you continue to struggle with. Jesus stands at the door of the rooms of your life and he's knocking. Will you let him in? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you for your way of being. But God, more than that, I thank you for you. I thank you that you are a God who cares enough to pursue us. You're the God who cares enough to get involved in our lives that wants to bring change. God, we thank you that you have the power to do that, that you're in control of everything, that you're here before the world was created, that you'll be here long after you, you change things and bring heaven back down to earth. God, we thank you that you give us your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're here today, that you're even reminding of us of those places in our own lives where we need to hear your voice calling, where we need to hear you knocking. And God, that as we open up those places, Lord, you can bring change. 
God, I pray for those who haven't yet put their trust in you, who haven't yet opened the door to even let you in a little way. God, I pray that they would see your love, that they would see your goodness and your kindness and your mercy and your grace. And Lord, would they be drawn to you? Would they open up their lives to your way so that they might be changed, so they might receive hope and healing in Jesus' name? So Lord God, we thank you for all these things. We thank you that we can live in your way, that you are with us, and that you don't want to leave our lives unchanged. So we pray this all in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Kyle. I invite you to stand with us. There must be more than this. Oh, breath of God, come breathe within. There must be more than this. Spirit of God, we wait for you. Fill us anew, we pray. Fill us anew, we pray. Consuming fire, fan into flame. A passion for your name, Spirit of God, fall in this place. Lord, have your way, Lord, have your way with us. Come like a rushing wind, clothe us with power from on high. Now set the captives free, leave us abandoned to your praise. Lord, let your glory fall. Lord, let your glory fall, consuming fire, fan into flame, a passion for your name, Spirit of God, fall in this place, Lord, have your way, Lord, have your way. Consuming fire, fan into flame, a passion for your name, Spirit of God, fall in this place, Lord have your way, Lord have your way with us. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
the night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven, the future sure. The price it has been paid For Jesus bled And suffered for my pardon And he was raised To overthrow the grave To this I hold My sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea Oh, the chains are released, I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said, that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne this i hold my hope is only jesus all the glory evermore to him shall repeat yet not i but through christ in me to this i hold my hope is only jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not i When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Thanks for joining us here this morning. Have a great week. Go with God.